now. Right now, I just want to introduce our guests, <clears throat> who are, uh, first is Susan Palke, who is coming to us from South, South Dakota. Dakota, where she is right now. She's a Nebraska resident, right? And she was the uh, sort of the head researcher and a, a camera person on the film, yes? Researcher and ca camera too, yes. <laughs> okay. And then uh, Elena Irasek is coming to us from Australia. So this is the second night in a row that we've had an Australian Zoomer, which means that it's tomorrow morning for you. That's so, right. Uh, good morning, Elena. Nice Hello. to see you. Um, and Elena is the Czech uh, translator for the film. Um, so thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. I'm and the director, James Lesur, is also with us. And James is a, well, I'm going to, your, your uh, title at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln is so long, I'm just going to read it. You ready? <laughs> Samuel Clark Waugh, Distinguished Professor of International Relations, and you're also the department chair of the history department, yes? Yes. Uh, and uh, James uh, is actually not in Nebraska right now. He's in South Dakota, where he's working on his next project, which maybe we'll get to in a minute. Um, but I really appreciate, and so James, I should mention uh, maybe right off that maybe we'll start with this. You went to Harvard, right? Yeah, I was at Harvard for a couple of years. I also worked at the Harvard Business School of all places. Okay, so uh, you were what, uh, in the uh, uh, graduate program in the history department or what? I was, Harvard had this really interesting program where I was in the creative writing program at Harvard. And then I was also in taking history classes and philosophy classes. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I spent a couple of years at Harvard trying to decide. And then I decided to go to the University of Chicago because at the time Harvard didn't have a really uh, good intellectual historian. Um, I was working with a guy named Donald Fleming at the time. And he was quite quite old, and so I decided to go move on to University the University of Chicago to finish my PhD. So. What years were you at Harvard? I'm just curious whether they might have been the same years that you sort of first started uh, realizing, as I did, <clears throat> the whole Velvet Revolution story, and uh, in the late '80s, <clears throat> and yeah. Hubble's rise to uh, pr the presidency. Well, that's a good question because I was at Harvard when I began to watch what was going on in Eastern Europe because I was there. I had applied to graduate school in 1988. And then I remember watching, you know, Tiananmen Square, uh, the Velvet Revolution, Eastern Europe. Um, I was also in, I was a, a DAD fellow in Germany in 1990. So I was in Germany for re, the reunification. Um, I was in Berlin um, that year because I was a fellow in, in Germany. Um, so I, I've always kind of wanted to work on this subject. It took me a long time to get here. Um, but it, I was at Harvard when I was watching that. And then I was started my PhD in Chicago in 1989 when it all happened. And it was a great time to start my PhD because it really set up like how I thought about that period, 1989, which to me, today seems like a fairy tale, honestly. You know, mm -hmm. the things that happened, the things that were achieved right. are miraculous when you think about it. Right. So, uh, Alana, I'm going to ask you, I, I don't, I forgot to ask you this while we were getting ready to go live here. Um, uh, what, uh, so I assume you're a Czech native? I am. I was born in the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. And, but yeah. you have the Australian accent. So where, when did you move? You know, at what age did you move? Um, so <clears throat> my family escaped in uh, 1969. Mm -hmm. And I came to Australia with my sister uh, and parents. And I was 12 and my sister was eight. So we went to school from then on and um, weren't able to return to the Czech Republic until 1989 or 90. Wow. Okay. So you got the uh, stories from uh, firsthand from your parents about the Soviet Union. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> we came from a town um, that had quite a lot of damage during the so Soviet invasion. It was Liberec. It was one of the first towns um, that um, actually quite a few people were killed. <clears throat> and um, Václav Havel happened to be in that town at, at that time uh, on holidays and um, as a result of the invasion he um, and some of his friends actually ended up taking over the radio station and broadcasting uh, to the rest of the country okay. so you know we had quite a quite a um, link to what was going on right um, and so be, uh, since especially oh, I would have asked this anyway but especially since we have Susan here who did a lot of the research um, which must have been a monumental job I would assume 
of, of combing through the archive, the, all that film footage, um, the, the, the film has such an abundance, such a, an incredible abundance of really great footage. And, uh, you know, there are moments, James, where you say, this has never before been seen or it's never been seen since it aired on, local, on you know, Czech television 50 years ago mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, do you both want to just address the idea of, you know, the mountains of stuff that you comb through, how you accessed most of it? Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, what a, what a huge piece of work it must have been to figure out how to piece it all together coherently. Yeah. Um, well, it's a couple of different steps that we took. Uh, first, uh, Marianne Chapkova and Susan and I made the pitch to Czech TV, uh, to begin to work on the archives with Martin Boda, who is a fantastic guy. Uh, he's really been a, a genuinely important person in the movie. Yeah. Uh, without Martin, we couldn't have made the movie. There's just no way. Um, and then, and then, and then began. Martin and I began to work, and then Elena um, came in because she is a Czech speaker, really fluent Czech speaker, uh, and I am not a very fluent Czech speaker. Um, and so Elena and I were working on, on going through the films together, and then the three of us essentially. It was the kind of the three people here who did the historical research together. So uh, 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 Elena, I say Elena, um, uh, and she says Elena, but I, I guess I haven't made that transition. <laughs> like, after three years, I just can't. Uh, uh, anyway, so, but the, but the three of us just worked together and, and going through the film. Um, mm -hmm. And it was an unbelievably dense task because we had to, we had to go through about six or 700 films to make this. Um, yep. The original version of the movie was, uh, six hours long, sure. <laughs> as you couldn't might imagine. I am not uh, a year ago, yeah, the first draft was six hours. And I made, I edited the first draft uh, of the film. And then we began to work with a production company in Prague. Um, and then they hired a professional editor. I, you know, I was editing as well as I could, but I wasn't trained as an editor. Hmm. So began to work with a really great editor um, in Prague. And then the story became, you know, what it is now which is a much more condensed uh, version. Uh, I don't think we, we did have, uh, we had long discussions about whether or not we were sacrificing too much by throwing certain things out. Um, but I was, so many things had to get dropped. You know, the editing floor and our, and our editing floor was really painful. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many exquisite materials, even stuff that you might, you know, when, for example, uh, um, you know, uh, we have, great film of Milo Kundera. We have a great film of mm -hmm. Milos Forman that wasn't in the movie, but was, we was in the movie until the last cut. Um, and, the, and we had to make sacrifices because, you know, we, we tried to stay focused on the art of descent. And that was really the hard sell for us. We had to stay focused on that topic and not go down these rabbit holes, which are incredibly interesting. You know, have I've Academy Award. Rabbit holes. Yeah, and, yeah, and we had, you know, <laughs> Jan Nemitz's film. So, so anyway, Susan, you you are a lawyer. You're not a film researcher yeah, necessarily. You're not an archivist. Uh, what what you know? How, or I mean, maybe you are. I don't know. But tell me why you know how you came to this gig, and um, you you know maybe what you already knew and what you learned from doing it. Because I'm you know because uh, you know I have Czech uh, blood myself, and so oh. you know I oh, so I always was always interested, and then. James was talking about it and I'd go like oh this is fascinating mm. and it just was inherently fascinating you yeah, know sure. and so you know I, I'd be researching we went like when we did the pitch to the Czech TV and they said well you know there are a lot of how the films and we're like but you know <laughs> United States really needs to hear it especially yeah. now we really right. need to this message across you know and so it was really and I think that kind of like moved them and they you know that they realize this you know to make it different then we went further on you know what made it more expansive and different with the art you know so it made it distinctive yeah it yeah important message yeah but anyway it was my it was just my own heritage that you know brought me you know and talking to James and then, and then I you know wanted to go so I went to Prague and just and then you get wow this is just fascinating you know and you're filming and it's just addictive you know because it's just yeah fascinating yeah right 
every stone you uncover, you're like, yeah. I want to go to the next one, right? I, I know there's something even better in the next yeah. one, right? You're just in, even though you're really, you know, you're an attorney. <laughs> right. So when James and I first started talking about this film, I think we discussed the fact that years, actually right after Havel died, uh, I wrote something for Rolling Stone about the plastic people of the universe and how, you know, there was a obvious rock and roll connection to Václav Havel's life in that they inspired him and vice versa. Right. Um, James, was it your idea or was it a collective idea to focus to that extent on the arts community? I mean, obviously Havel came out of the arts community as a playwright, but the -hmm. fact that the plastic people had such an impact um, and uh, the fact that Marta, uh, how do you say her last name? Kubisova? Kubitsova? Kubitsova. Kubitsova. Oh, sorry, the uh, uh, wrong syllable I'm emphasizing, right? Kubitsova. Elena, am I, are you going to give me that one? <laughs> Kubitsova. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, obviously we, in America, I knew about the plastic people. We, I wouldn't have known about Marta, Marta you know? Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, who's, who's uh, wh- where did the idea come from? Because that, that gives the film such a... a, a it gives it such a, 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 a different tone than, you know, another film about uh, political, straight up political history would have. Yeah. Um, and it also, I, I think maybe gives it more of a connection to the radical 60s in America where everything is got soundtrack to the soundtrack of the Vietnam War, basically, right? All the rock music, all the acid rock bands or whatever. So was that your mm-hmm. idea, James, or was it a collective decision? Well, I wouldn't say it was, well, well yeah, I, I probably thought of it, but we all talked about it. You know, um, we, we worked as a team. We we're a real true team. And, you know, the sadness about not being with you tonight is our team, our whole team can't be here. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the core part of our team is here. Um, and so we had many discussions. One of the decisions to be honest with you, I'm an historian. So I didn't want to make a movie just about Václav Havel. Um, uh, in part because there are other movies about Vasa Um and I've seen them, I know about them, and I've read every book written about Havel, I'm sure, <laughs> and more. Um, and, and, you know, I just knew a lot, but I also thought that Havel's story isn't Havel's story. It's a st- story of a community, and that we wanted to get at the community, the networks, um, more than anything else. I also wanted to do a story that would be in, uh, inclusive of women because generally the story of descent that we know tends to be very male and having Marta uh, come in um, and other people that we interviewed that were in the movie, right? Um, uh, that was really important for us because it brings the, the more comprehensive picture of what descent looked like in Czechoslovakia in, from 68 to the Velvet Revolution. Mm-hmm. I also believe that, you know, Havel became Havel in part because of what he did with the plastics. Yeah. I mean, it really affected his career. So when he stood up, you know, to defend the plastics, he went to jail for it. He, as we know, he almost committed suicide during that first jail, uh, jail term. Um, and, you know, it really transformed him. Um, and then he kept resisting and kept articulating kind of resistance to defend you know, these people with long hair and you know, quite frankly, not great musicians, but now they become great, right? They're really well known. Um, and I like how Paul Wilson talks about that, you know, like this the way, you know, he talks about music <laughs> together, yeah. not great, but, you know, the importance is to be together. Yes. Um, yeah. Anyway, so the, the, the couple of things I wanted to make sure that we'd have a movie that did have women, really prominent women involved. I also really, you know, how the story of Marta came in, I was reviewing film probably with the, this group here. And I just kept watching that song for Marta that she sings in 1989. Um, And I said, I've got to focus on this because it's such a big part of the the story in 89, right? And she's pushed out on the balcony. She hadn't sung for publicly for decades, two decades, basically. Um, And then you've got this moment where we, uh, Elena and I were in Prague at her last concert last year. It was fantastic. That was huh. like one of the most magnificent events I've ever seen. And mm-hmm. that crowd that it was in Lucerna Palace, it was just rock and roll. There were so many people standing on their feet, clapping. Mm-hmm. She's a real heroine uh, for the Czech Republic now. Um, and, you know, to me, I, I, you know, she's also incredibly sexy when she was younger, right? Beautiful voice, beautiful woman. And her career was cut in half, just absolutely decapitated by 68. 
right? Um, and I wanted to show what happened to the artists who were, she was Elvis, really. I mean, if she had gone on, she would have been something like Elvis, I think, um, because she was that cool. And she, she you know, she married Jan Nemitz, the, the filmmaker. Um, and he shot a lot of the film. Some of the film that's in the movie is Jan Nemitz's. We were editing Jan Nemitz's hmm. film, yeah. uh, which is, again, it's owned by Czech TV, so we, we did it. It's just an incredible experience when you're sitting there and you're watching. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have we have the longer versions, not the we have like the movies that they made, right? Yeah. And it, incredibly beautiful. That was one of the hardest things to, to figure out which songs to put in because mm -hmm. she sang so many songs. Um, and then the Euro Party part of it, you know, yeah. um, it's just it's just we wanted to have a musical component to the to this because you're right, the '68s and you know the Vietnam era is so musical for Americans. It was just as musical for the, the Czechs and the Slovaks. Art yeah. was very important to Czechoslovakia. And, you know, it's a visceral being kind of a Czechoslovakia. and so important, I think, to human beings. It, there's a visceralness that we take from it. So that was extremely important, I thought, to, to mm -hmm. include the art. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Elena, so what, what do you want to say about that? Well, no, I just wanted to um, maybe point out that the way we worked was quite amazing. Um, and the way we met, in fact, was, you know, all quite accidental. Um, uh, my sister and I went to Nebraska, uh, for first time to the Midwest, um, to attend um, a conference that James organised to commemorate the 50 years anniversary of the Prague Spring, or the, um, yeah, in fact, focusing on the positive part of that year rather than the invasion. And um, so... Um, and from then on, you know, we, we got to know um, other members of the team and we didn't realise we were going to be working together and that happened a little bit later on. But um, the way we worked was actually around the globe and around the clock. So, for example, you know, Martin Boda would select some of the footage, he'd show it to James in America and I would translate it overnight and the next day it would start all over again. So, you know, the, the way the clips were selected, we just kept going around 24 hours all the time for at least a year, if not a bit longer. Right. A couple of years. I didn't sleep for like literally for years because I was always on different time zones. I was on the Czech month and, and the Australian ones. <laughs> yeah, and there's yeah. a lot of um, messaging by messenger, so the phone would beep in the middle of the night. So. Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> and I kept that as a record. I still have the record of all the conversations we had about every piece of thing we used. And it must be thousands of pages long uh all the like because we basically made the movie via facebook messenger um, <laughs> that's how we worked that's how we did it because we were messaging all the time and then i'd load a, i'd load the film to vimeo and we'd talk about it and then research it and you know figure out what to use right check your dropbox there's a clip in there that i need you to look at right <laughs> yeah. basically i yeah. yeah. So, uh, James, a few minutes ago, you mentioned the books, the various books about Havel. And I just want to mention that. Um, at, so we watched your film for the first time, uh, you know, months ago when um, you first submitted it. And, um, and and then I much more recently watched it again to prepare for this interview. And um, so in between times, you know, I, uh, you know, knew, I remember like you did when you were in school, you know, we must be roughly the same age. And I remember... Mm -hmm the, um, you know, the news reports about Havel um, ascending to the presidency and just thinking how neat that was at the time, you know, um, and uh, that that this former playwright, <clears throat> an obvious outsider and dissident be became the president of the country. It was so symbolic, you know, and but mm -hmm. I had not actually um, dug all that much deeper. And so I read I picked up a copy and read um, a, a big chunk of Letters to Olga, which is a huge book, actually. But this summer at, at a certain point after having watched the film the first time. So can you just sort of, you kind of talk about it briefly in the film, but mm -hmm. for the viewer's experience, can you kind of explain a little more in depth what Letters to Olga is and why it's so powerful? Yeah, th that's a really important book for me. Uh, it's an important book for the film too. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's truncated. It's a tiny part of what, what, what I was originally going to do with it. Yeah. You know, um, I, I'm, I do I do intellectual history, so I do a lot of philosophy and intellectual history, and I've I'm you know I'm pretty familiar with uh, Heidegger and the um, you know the um, the phenomenologists basically. Mm -hmm. When he was in prison, the, the the network of dissent was so interesting because basically his brother Ivan organized these seminars, and they would get together. Yeah, they, there's the book. They would get together, um, and then uh, 
they would pick out philosophy texts, basically, Nyapatochka's work, et cetera, and, who's also a phenomenologist. Um, and they, they would get together and, 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 and basically pin, they would collectively pin the letters that go into prison. And they did it, uh, Ivan told us, uh, Susan was in the interview with Sivan, uh, with Ivan, um, uh, um, and Marianne Chapkova, Susan and I interviewed uh, Ivan uh, Havel at his house. Uh, and he said that they would get together, they would select these things and they chose the hardest possible text to, to send to him because they wanted to keep him alert. Uh, you know, he, he was, he says he's in that letters to Olga, he says he's a, he's a slave. Uh, he's a slave in the communist system. He calls himself, he's a slave laborer. He talks about it like that, right? He's cleaning the sheets for hospitals or whatever, right? Um, but, but he's also talking about philosophy a lot. So letters to Olga is very philosophical. And it, for me, I wrote my first book was basically on, on phenomenological discussions of anti-colonial movements. That's what my first book was about. Um, so it was really in my wheelhouse. And I really went down into that book really pretty far uh, because I wanted to make sense of it. And also, you know, there's the expression at the end of the movie, the horizon of being. He's talking about the horizon of being a lot. That's a, that's a phenomenological concept that comes out of Heidegger and whose role in that group. Um, and then also into the French phenomenologist, you know, uh, I was a friend of Paul Ricoeur in Paris. I, you know, he, I interviewed him and he's in my first book. Um, so he's really connected to the philosophical world that I knew. But the cool thing about Havel, the thing I just love about Václav Havel is he was autodidactic. He never went to college. He couldn't go to college because of the communist state. Mm -hmm. So he had to do all this himself. So, but he was studying really high level philosophy mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of coming to him through the prison letters, <laughs> right? One a week, right? And then he'd write these things back. And when we did the interview with Michael Shantosky, who was, you know, eventually an ambassador, he's running for Senate right now in the Czech mm -hmm. Republic. Mm -hmm. um, he told us, you know, he talked a lot about this as, as well. Because um, he, Michael Shantosky wrote the kind of the biggest Havel book, uh, probably for an American audience. And he wrote that in English too. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we, 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 we decided to really focus on that because I really believe that, that the, that's the core idea of Havel. It's the horizon of being. It's essential to understand. And a lot of people don't think about Czech, Czech playwrights or presidents having that kind of philosophical basis. Yeah. But wouldn't it be nice today? <laughs> Just saying, given all the things that are going on in the world today, to well, have we'll someone to talk about, <laughs> talk about like the, how you turn <laughs> suffering into love. Yeah. Right. And that comes from that, that experience of being in prison and the way he thought about it. And also the network that kept him alive for four years. Uh -huh. You know, because it was brutal, uh, uh, just suffocating, uh, you know, for a playwright not to be able to write anything but a letter a week is really incredible torture, right? And that's a, that was deliberate. That's what the communist regime wanted. They wanted to torture intellectuals like that. Huh. Okay. In my view. We have a I question. Can... Sorry, go ahead. No, that's Okay. We have a question from, we have a couple questions, but I want to uh, line them up. Um, because a couple of them are going to, are going to come into play in a minute or two. But this one's from a, a viewer named Ken, and Ken uh, wants to know about, given how Dubček went along with the normalization process in 68, how did he become a parliamentarian leader in the, you know, after the Velvet Revolution? Was, why was he, I guess Ken's question is, why was he accepted uh, again by the Czech people, but I think that he, well, I mean, you answered the question, but he, he didn't leave under bad circumstances in terms of the Czech people. They knew that he was fighting for them and trying to do the right thing in 68, yeah? Well, I, I think there's a, Lane could also speak to this, but there's, I think there are why, there are lots of different interpretations about him. A lot of the younger Czech people I know tend to think of him uh, as, um, Mm, I would just say mm, uh, naive to, to be polite um, uh, because he clearly didn't really understand what he was up against. To me, I read a, a lot of Duke Tech's works and it's stunning to me uh, that he just didn't understand because he was, he's really about reforming communism. He wasn't about overthrowing communism. Right. right? So his naivete comes in at the belief that he could reform the communist yep. state because it was definitely not going to be reformed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and his, it's stunning to me that he, well, he's also educated in Russia. So it's not so stunning. It makes sense. 
but just how incredibly stupid he was about the, the Russian empire. Um, and I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying it just doesn't seem very smart. If you know the history of colonialism and the Czechs and Slovaks thought of it as, as a colonial experience in a certain sense, right? Then it just doesn't make sense that he believed that he could do what he thought he could do. Uh, but at the same time, he did. He did later write that he just was wrong about it. You know, but was Havel, just, we put. Was he just kind of a ho- sorry to interrupt? Was he just kind of a hopeless optimist who just <laughs> thought that things would be better than you know they were, and that he just refused to believe that if he tried to reform communism and it would be good for the party, that uh, you know that it would be something that they could then turn around and sell to the to the more democratic states in Europe. It would be good for the. He just he just kind of pulled the wool over his own eyes because he was. Is, is there anything I, I, there? I, well, I think his experience of being educated in Russia and, you know, his, his old family experience in Russia is really, really interesting. Um, and he writes about it, that in his memoirs. Um, you know, he, I really do believe that he thought that he could, he could, he could win. I mean, yeah. he didn't think he was going to lose. He thought he was going to win. He also, like, if you think about it, 50, 56 in Hungary, for, for a historian, in hindsight, it makes, it's obvious what's going to happen. But, you know, it wasn't hindsight, it was 68. And yeah. which we do make the point that, you know, in 68, the Czechoslovakia is the place to be. It's not America, it's not Paris, uh, it's not, you know, other places. Yeah, yeah. It's, sure. it's, the, it's Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Uh, because it was so cool and so vibrant and so artistic and so creative, right? Um, I mean, you know, Milos Forman left in 68. Um, those people went into, many people went into exile after 68. You know, Milan Quindero went into exile later, right? But still, I mean, there was just an incredibly vibrant place and Havel's work was amazing before, you know, before and after 68. Um, so I think it's fair to say that he's probably not the only one who believed, but Václav Havel did warn him, look, you're playing with fire. Uh, he wrote, you know, open, he wrote letters to Dubček saying, <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, because this is not going to go well, right? Uh, and and, and things up and so people were with that you know so they remember that you know by the time that was 89 they still remember that he was helping with the loosening up process you know back in 68 but obviously that didn't pan out right so Ken Ken X is actually following up a little bit here which he's saying the film indicates that he was a close collaborator I guess with the Soviets after the invasion and then he says no like is 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 that is is he reading that correctly or if I could just say, you know, sure. like he yeah. wasn't the only naive person, you know, there, there was so much um, joy and exuberance about the loosening up of, um, you know, some of the tightness of the communist regime, which had been going on since 1964, in fact, you know, and then the Prague Spring is labelled from the beginning of 68 when Dubček actually comes out and, and challenges the party. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he had backing, you know, the people loved him all that time and, um, you know, everyone was really hopeful because, you know, there are quite a few uh, <clears throat> uh, Western um, sort of footage of Western newspaper um, do- um, film and, um, mm. sorry, I'm sorry, there were Western journalists in Prague and they were interviewing mm. people early, early August of 1968 and nobody had an idea that anything was going to go wrong. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, he, there is a sort of a tendency at the moment to criticise not just Dubček, but even Havel <laughs> for getting things wrong. And, you know, it's just so easy to do that in hindsight, when in fact, maybe for Dubček, it was the only way to go to suggest reform, because, to, you know, to actually do a complete counter-revolution was impossible. Yeah. So right. he, yeah, yeah. he was in that particular place of history, and mm-hmm. he, he suffered for it at the end as well. Okay, mm-hmm. so that brings us to the sort of the $68 question. And I'm going to give it to one of the viewers because he asked this early on and I kind of uh, typed in a quick note saying, uh, hang on, Brooks. So this is Brooks. He's a friend of ours locally. Um, and uh, so his question is, I'm just going to read it because he's got a, he's, he's kind of has a run up to it. Uh, the film ends on an optimistic note. Uh, in light of the current situation here in the U.S., do you still feel optimistic as we're on the verge of entering our own period of autoc- autocratic control and end to democratic government? So clearly there's parallels that you don't explicitly voice in the film, but I think Susan, you just mentioned something like, you know, well, you know, what's going on here in America right now, this gives us a chance to address this. So, you know, clearly you, well, I mean, a couple things I think are clear. You started making the film before we could have known how far down this road America would be right now. We were already concerned. Though. Yes. We, okay. Well, yeah. 
I, 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 I was on the record with media before, you know, a year before Trump got elected, thinking wow. that he would be elected because I just believed that there was something, there, there was something happening that actually uh, most American liberals are just blindsided by that we have, uh, we just didn't see it. Like, uh, well, I, I did, but you know, cause that's, I'm an historian. So I kind of look at yep. mass movements yep. and things like that. Sure. So yeah, I could see not, it, so right. Like, and one of the well, one of the things that we tried to do, and Mariana and I talked about this. You know, we were originally going to just have the movie about Havel, right? And the the Velvo Revolution. That was kind of what we were thinking because it was that in '89. We were thinking, and then we started to make the movie. Um, and you know, if we had just done it about the '89, I, I don't think anybody would think it's that optimistic anymore because so much so much has gone wrong, even in the Czech Republic and in America after a nine, right? And if you look what happens, what's happening right now in Hong Kong and other places, it's still going wrong, right? Um, so I, but at the same time, I do think that it's the hardship that created <laughs> the good stuff, mm -hmm. ironically. I mean, because we've had nothing but bread and butter for the last 30 years. Right. And look what we've done, right? I mean, if you think about it, we've been the most incredibly wealthy, you know, we've had all the, progress that we wanted in politics that most of us wanted to achieve. And then it all happened in a vacuum and it disappeared. It's disappearing right in front of our eyes, right? And I think that it's important to kind of look at how dissidents reacted to that under regimes like the communist regime in Czechoslovakia, because if we, we, because it helps us kind of navigate, I think certain, I don't like to draw parallels to say, this is a fascist regime. I just don't do that with my yeah. work as an historian. Mm -hmm. um, I, I try to avoid those those things. I know a lot of my colleagues do. I just don't. I don't do that. Uh, but I do think that we're in trouble. There's no question about that, right? Um, but we. That's why we made the movie because we could kind of see it coming if you were paying attention in 2016. It was obvious. He wasn't going to use names, shall we say? But it would be so obvious, you know, that there's a parallel thing going on, you know. So in the film, obviously, there's many allusions to the fact that the protests in uh, in the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia uh, in 68 and also in 89 were so theatrical. Like, so whether it's, you know, Marta singing or the, the V sign or the keys rattling or all that, you know, I mean, uh, Timothy Gardner at one point says that was so impressive, mm -hmm. just amazing, you know, 300,000 people all rattling their keys at once. What kinds of lessons can that teach? I mean, you know, uh, uh, we've been bombarded with so many different things to, uh, you, you know, so, so many tense moments in, in the last few years that people have hit the streets for all kinds of things, right? So people yeah. went yeah. to see, uh, to the, people have been paying respects at the Supreme Court this week. People have gone to the various women's marches, including the day after the inauguration, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you yeah. know, the Black Lives Matter movement, obviously, but, you know, the, 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 everybody's attentions are sort of pulled in a million directions because it's not just about one thing. It's not about the Soviets, mm -hmm. you know, invading or whatever. It's about multiple different cultural issues. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I guess uh, my long-winded way around to a question is, what does that theatricality of what the Czechs did have to say to Americans who are inclined to hit the streets over these various issues or maybe do so uh, if necessary uh, after the election, if there's, if there's no decision, you know, if, if there's confusion mm -hmm. over what the decision is? I would just like to add that, you know, there's a certain musicality to the Czech protest as well. Mm. You, know, the, mm. you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people singing at the same time. Yeah. It wasn't just no marketing. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, well, one of, one of the key things that we wanted to discuss or get at was you know, when the Czechs decided, or the Czechs and Slovaks chose a president when they, when they decided to choose Havel, you know, they went to somebody who wasn't trying to be a politician, right? Yeah. Um, who, uh, he, you know, he, Havel's failure, and this is, we had to cut a lot of this stuff, but his failure, if there's a failure, is just he didn't believe in political parties. How could you after, like, suffering under communism, right? He didn't believe in politics. He didn't believe in, he believed in politics as a way of, you know, transforming the world. 
but he, he wasn't that kind of politician that we have today so often, right? He was more um, of a diplomat, right? More the people, well, not the institutions. Yeah. yeah, he was, but the thing, Hoffa has taken a lot of criticism in the Czech Republic and other places recently, which I just don't agree with, um, to mm. be honest with you, mostly because I read. Uh, to be, I don't think those people saying a lot of that stuff are reading that much about mm -hmm. Havel because if you read his essays uh, and if you read them carefully after he became president, he was really writing every essay himself. He was a craftsman. He worked with words and he believed that his words would have a meaning. And they did. I mean, you know, everybody who is anybody went to Prague um, in, in after 89. Right. Mm -hmm. Every major world statesman. Uh, and I, and we did the interviews, some interviews with some people that we didn't use in the movie, but you know, the, even, the, even the South Africans, uh, the African regime, went to Prague to help figure yeah. out how to, how to have the transformation in South Africa. Mm -hmm. so, th so in other words, Mandela benefited from the kinds of activities that they had in Prague and the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, right? Um, because he helped create this kind of notion of no retribution. And I think one of the lessons I would like to have us have, and it might mm -hmm. be hard now in America, because it, the, the, the protests are so severe, the crimes of the past are so severe, right? Um, that, you know, the, I, you know, I'm about peace and reconciliation. So one of, the, one, one of the things we're trying to achieve with the movie is just have people think about that way of life. And, you know, and at the same time, you know, the Czechs didn't have the kind of slavery that America had for, you know, centuries. Uh, they're not dealing with the same um, kind of, legacies that, that we have in the United States about mm -hmm. racism and mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Um, and maybe it's easier than, I don't think it's any easier for the Czechs than it's any easier for people today. Uh, it was really, re they did not know. And this came out in the movie. No one knew what was going to happen. We, 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 we saw the revolution, but it was possible that it could go the other way. That the, if the Russian, if the, you know, if the Soviets had stepped in, and crush the uh, and and come back in the old school. Uh, it could have gone the other way. Uh, I think we're, we're we are naive to think that it was never going to happen because it was possible. The difference is that Gorbachev understood that mm -hmm. that game was up, and and he played the same kind of card that Dubček did. He wanted to reform communism in a certain sense, um, and it, but it's it's really clear that when you go back and look at this, the the archives, re the, especially the film archives. Um, the film archives are really amazing because the, the materials that we have from the film archives show what they are capturing. That's not what they showed. And we tried to point this out, but they have incredible footage of people being beaten up and savagely beaten up, right? Uh, this was a violent, uh, there was violence in those against the protesters, right? Mm -hmm. um, the had incredible footage of, of you know, the propaganda. Yeah. yeah. And you see that on certain channels going on <laughs> today, you know, but it's it's a some deja vu going on. So, so we have um, one more question from an audience member, and I think maybe this would be a good place to wrap up. We'll we'll see how that goes. But and I also want to see if Susan and or Elena want to address this one, um, because I understand. I don't know that we've mentioned it during this session, but. I know you talked about it earlier and I think I already knew this. There's a different version, slightly different version than what we just saw that's showing on or is show, is showing or has shown on Czech TV, right? It's going to be broadcast next December for the 10th anniversary of, uh, of Asa Lava's death. Oh, got it. Okay. So if, if you all can address, um, the, the, the question is from Chad and he's saying, how is the film or the Czech version viewed in the Czech Republic? Um, so, you know, explain what's different about the Czech version. And then you're also talking about, you know, people's uh, opinions of Dubček and Havel maybe shifting over time a little bit. And so how, how is the film being, or, well, you haven't, they haven't seen it yet, but, you know, um, people at the, at the uh, Czech TV have seen it, right? Mm -hmm. So Susan or Elena, do you want to address that first? No, it would be a good one for this one. Yes. Elena, go ahead. Oh, I think we can all say something about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, she, she's the person to ask. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> I think um, uh, quite a few Czech people have seen it now, as, as well as the Czech TV. Um, Czech TV was very happy with it. The versions are actually identical, except for the dialogue is translated into the two languages. Oh, okay. Mirror image. Um, <clears throat> so. 
uh, the trick was to actually make a movie that was acceptable to both an international audience as well as the home audience because it really needed to be credible and, you know, f full enough of facts for the Czech people to accept it and also for people who never heard of the subject before to understand it as well because, you know, it's such a, a long swathe of history and, um, you know, the way it's done in an hour and a half is just amazing. Um, so the tech people who've seen it, we've or had responses, you know, they all love it. Um, <clears throat> some of them are saying, you know, this is long overdue. Um, nobody has made a movie like this about the dissident movement, um, you know, in the last um, 30 years since the Velvet Revolution. Um, and... Um, you know, it's a surprise that Czech people haven't been able to, um, you know, focus um, their interest in addressing, um, you know, gaps of history that haven't actually been, even been talked about properly in the Czech Republic um, mm. since that time. So um, I think it's actually bringing some, something new to the Czech peoples and that, that, that's why they're interested in it. There are things in, in the movie that they had not known of before and... Um, so we're hoping that there will be, a, you know, a good response to it when it's actually aired um, on TV. But before that, I'm sure it will go to a few Czech festivals and um, um, there is a bit of a momentum gathering. And there are other people making um, other movies about Havel, about, for example, the last years of Havel's life, but they're focusing on something different. And there's, you know, there's an interest in bringing this topic back. Um, in fact, um, you know, people are also interested in learning about a, a contrast to the current Czech government at the moment, which is not as good as it could be. So I think it should have a good um, response in the Czech Republic. And, you know, we really wanted to get the message out to other countries as well. So yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's fulfilling its purpose. Yeah. Yeah, it went on further than most, you know, went on and what happened after 89, how to reconstruct, you know, into a democracy and the challenges that are very real, as we are all experiencing still, you know, here and now. But um, mm -hmm. I think that, that we did have a distinct, you know, a lot of distinctiveness with the, the arts and then that we went, we told a fuller story that, like, like you said, that, you know, hadn't been explored so fully, you know, just the fairy tale but beyond. Mm -hmm. James yeah, so, yeah, I think if the story isn't told now, it could actually be, you know, lost because um, there, there is a bit of a backlash to um, more democratic times, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. James, yeah, you want to wrap up in some way on that, uh, on that thought? Well, yeah, we, we have had really positive reviews. Um, it was reviewed about two weeks ago in, in Respect, uh, really one of the really prominent magazines in the Czech Republic. Um, you know, and I think the people that I've talked to have seen it really, really like it, because especially the younger generation, you know, um, they, they weren't alive when this happened. Yeah. Um, sure. And, you know, there was one person that we were, that a really good friend of mine, uh, Petra Holova, she's a very accomplished writer in the Czech Republic. She was originally going to write the script with me. Um, we decided to not to do it that way, but but she watched the movie and, and she's an incredibly brilliant young writer. Um, she's also incredibly critical of uh, the dissident movement and also the current government. Uh, and she said it's it's a movie that has two perfect endings, right? Uh, because it talks about you know the problems of today, but also has the kind of you know little pixie dust in it, right? <laughs> about the the magic, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And she said, you've accomplished the thing that we just couldn't figure out how to do when we were trying to figure out how to write the script originally. Uh, like, which way do we go? Do we want to end like the, with the good stuff? Or we want to say, you know, <laughs> there were drug mafias that moved in Prague. I mean, the, the, the archives of the, the drug stuff, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, there, so, and, and there are other things that, that, that people are really quite upset about. Uh, the whole, the way privatization was done, the kind of just incredible well, just problems, uh, economic problems that come from this. Um, but at the same time, you know, we wanted to have a movie that would speak to something that would give us a little bit of hope. And I'm a fan of Rocky, you know, I'm just, I grew up in the Rocky movies. Hmm. And this is, to me, Vasav Havel is the intellectual Rocky, right? Uh, you know, he's, we might be the exact same age, because so did I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just how I think, like, I, and I yeah. grew up, you know, I, went into, I was an athlete because I watched Rocky and yeah, I yeah. ran marathons and I, you know, I did all this stuff because I was just, I think movies, if we do them right, can do that. They can make us, they can make yeah. us, you know, they believe in something, right? 
Uh, and, and believing in just the possibility of belief is a really big achievement. And I think movies can, cinema can do that and really interesting, not to propagandize. Um, I'm not naive. I'm not trying to be a Yankee who goes to Prague to make a movie at all. I just, uh, but I do think that, that that story, if you think about it, that's really seditious in a certain sense. I mean, it's underhanded because you're going to the Czech Republic to look for something optimistic to bring back <laughs> over here, which is really interesting, right? Yeah. But at the same time, the story is so grand, you know, the yeah. guy who helped and the whole group of people who, and, you know, um, you know, Edda Krasova, the, the writer, when she says, it was such a big castle and there were people with, you know, our person just knew karate. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. And, and, and the, the Kafka hats and, you know, and like, <laughs> but that's where I think, oh, I, I think that world, even the politics of that is possible. Right? Yeah. But we have to get over just this other stuff. And I'm not sure how to do that. I'm not sure movies will help us do this, but I hope they can help us speak that language, you know? Yeah. So that's how I'd wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, and, okay. You know, I have to say also the team, just the, the group of people who worked on this, we're family now, uh, yeah. you know, like there's, it's a real kind of extremely tight knit uh, group of people. Uh, and we all just have incredible friendship together. You know, we see each other as often as we can. Um, and also, you know, I just, Martin Boda is the true star of this movie. I'm just telling you, Martin Boda is a superstar archivist and he was so much fun to work with. He's very, you know, he's a very almost shy person. Uh, and he was so fun and so gracious and worked so hard with us. Um, and I think he shocked his own like Czech TV because they didn't know what was in the archives. Yeah, they, they didn't know and work with us and woo. <laughs> they had no idea what we found until we got it out. And then every I, other filmmakers I've talked to have said, I can't believe this stuff you guys got. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's uh, the one last thing I would just want to say. One of the things that I think we did that was really truly beautiful is, is that one of the people in the movie is Joseph Lohi. We mentioned him. He's the filmmaker who was shooting the film of the plastic people that the police took and confiscated. And that to me was a really cool thing. And Martin Boda and I interviewed him last, last year, right at the end, because we found out that Czech TV didn't own that, that film because it was confiscated by the police. They took it to the, they took it and broadcast it. Uh, and Joseph Lohi was incredibly proud that we told his mm -hmm. story. Right. And no checks knew about this story at all. Oh, wow. uh, we found it only when we cleared the rights that we had to check TV said, uh, red flag, the, the cool plastic, some of the cool plastic film they didn't own. You don't own it, and right? We had, yeah. And so we had to find him. <laughs> we had to find Joseph Lohi. And then he told the story about, you know, they threatened that he would go to prison for eight years if he didn't give him the film. And oh. I think that that also is a great thing because he's very happy, I think, and proud that we told his story that was dormant for, you know, since 1975. Mm -hmm. No one knows what happened to him. Uh, mm -hmm. And they essentially killed his film career. He began, he worked a little bit, he worked in Czech TV afterwards, but only because he gave them the film uh, uh, that allowed them to use his, his, his film in that way, wow. which is, and that's what communism did. Uh, the communist state did, at least. Right, wow, okay. Um, Total pleasure talking to all of you. Um, thanks for the advice to, to the extent that you gave us advice about what might be upcoming for uh, we Americans. Um, <laughs> uh, I've been looking forward to this all week, so stick with me for one second. It's been a long and um, very satisfying week of doing these Q&As every night. Some, uh, Terry, our tech guy, just joked to me the other day if I felt like I'm doing a late night talk show at this point, which is what sort of what it feels like. And now we're at the end of the, the uh, this year's uh, Newburyport Documentary Film Festival. So listen to this. Oh, you couldn't hear it. I just cried. Oh, look at that. And it's oh, overflowing. Yeah. It is a Czech beer. That I'm looking oh, forward really? to having right now. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, well, I can't open it because I wasn't prepared to drink like on live, right? But I do have, you have one right there, uh, right? You know, I, not a check here, but <laughs> like, I'm ready to pop it. <laughs> well, so anyway, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, so, so if, if you were here in person, we'd be sharing it. Uh, you know, I'd be sharing a glass with you, raising a glass with you. Um, but I'm doing it virtually. 
um, and it's all over my desk now, but that's okay because we have plenty <laughs> of time. <laughs> well, um, we'll, th we'll, thanks so much. We'll, thank you, thank you for having us. It's an honor to be here. Really, thank you for showing our film and letting us talk to you. Yeah, uh, pleasure thank having you. you. So thanks, James. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Alana. Uh, thank and I uh, look forward to the next project, um, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Yeah, excellent. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.